Hey, what's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm going to be looking at three different drive units from Purify. Purify is been around for a couple years now, but they are still relatively new in the overall grand scheme of things, but they're really shaking things up with their design and a lot of their technical information that they put out there on their website. These three speakers I've reviewed full tilt. All the data that I'm about to talk about is on my website and there's plenty Plenty more where that came from. The first one we're going to talk about is the PTT 6.5 M. Now the M for this drive unit stands for mid-range. And you can naturally guess that this drive unit is better suited for mid-range capabilities, maybe better designed or intended for mid-range capabilities, as opposed to mid-bass, mid-woofer capabilities. And one thing I want to show you, and it's going to be somewhat hard to see, but right through this area right here, let me see here, right there. Now normally you see some copper in that area and that would be the voice coil windings, but you don't see that in this particular speaker, which means that the voice coil windings is a little bit shorter. So it is gonna have a little bit less linear throw than the counterparts to this particular driver. This one has a linear excursion verified by the Clipple at about 3.3 millimeters one way. And that is actually limited by BL unlike the other two drivers that we're going to talk about where they are limited by CMS. So the suspension is the limiter for the other two, whereas the motor force symmetry is the limiter for this particular speaker. Now, why is that the case? Well, again, I think that kind of goes back to the design intent that this is more of a mid-range, but I would be interested if the Purify guys maybe want to add a little bit of information. If you guys do see this video, which I'm thinking you probably will, Feel free to, to add as much as you want to in the comments below, and I'll make sure to pin that at the top so anybody watching this video can have your firsthand information. And while I'm at it, I will also say that Lars Riesbo has been a guest on this channel about a year and a half ago, and he went into great, great detail in about an hour and a half long discussion about Purify, how they came to be, and the surround design, which I know a lot of people are thinking, what the heck? I've seen all sorts of people say really interesting things about this surround. But what I can tell you is that the surround is designed this way as intended. What happens is a lot of speakers will, when they reach full excursion, they kind of deform and their radiating surface area isn't quite the same as it is when it's at mid range. So just like normal resting position or when it's all the way inset. And because of that, you can have some modulation of the harmonics due to that. Now, that's a, a very broad level take on it. For more information, again, I do encourage you to go watch that video and I'll link it right here in the card. So make sure you click that. From there, we will go to talking about the price though. So for this particular drive unit, on Purify's website direct today, the price is 385 US dollars each. Now, I'm gonna show you the data. We're gonna look at the frequency response and the harmonic distortion, and then we're gonna move on to the next driver. So the frequency response for this driver shows an average sensitivity of about 88 dB, and that's at 2.83 volts, one meter. And I would say that about 90 Hertz or 80 Hertz, you're about three dB down from that mean average. The breakup starts to occur around three kilohertz and the beaming starts to occur at around 1.8 kilohertz or so. And that's gonna be just due to the actual diameter of the speaker. So these aren't really anything new that we're expecting to see. You could take, based on the data that I'm seeing, you could take a notch filter at around three kilohertz and drop that down. And the reason I say that is because the off-axis response trends pretty well with the on-axis, but that's still only going to get you so far. Just due to the beaming alone, I would say that two kilohertz is probably going to be your rough estimate for a intended acoustic target crossover point and bringing your tweeter in at around that point is probably gonna make more sense if you're running this as a two-way, typical with a dome tweeter. Now, if you're gonna use a waveguide, you may want to constrain your radiation pattern a little bit more to match up with that waveguide, depending on how narrow that waveguide is. So in that case, you may wanna extend your crossover point maybe a little bit higher, but really that's ultimately up to you and the design. And that's one reason why I don't talk about my subjective thoughts on speakers because it, it frankly just doesn't make sense for me to do that. When I'm reviewing, a drive unit by itself for me to say, I heard X, Y, or Z. Well, all that's gonna go out the window as soon as you put it in an enclosure or as soon as you made it up to a tweeter or a waveguide, put a crossover on it, whatever. All that goes straight out the window. So in my opinion, the best thing to do is to provide you with the data. So if you want to, you can copy this data, you can pull up a modeling program, and then you can model the best enclosure, uh, the best baffle, 
and maybe the best crossover configuration for this and then whatever else other drivers you plan to use. Looking at the harmonic distortion, it's below 1% THD until about 100 Hertz. And then at 100 Hertz, you start to increase below that frequency in terms of distortion. Not a big deal. I mean, a matter of fact, I think this is pretty darn good because you're at around negative 50 dB for the most part. And once you put a crossover on the speaker, you're going to drop some of that low end harmonic distortion as well. Next up is the PTT 6.5X. Now you'll notice that this is an aluminum cone. These retail for about $425 each USD direct from Purify. And earlier I mentioned on the previous driver that you could not see as much copper in the voice call extending as high as you normally would for another driver of its size, you know, typically. Uh, and you can actually see the opposite here is that case for this particular driver. So the voice call winding go up quite a bit higher and that may make you think it's gonna have some more linear excursion and it does. Looking at my notes here, I show that it has five millimeters one way linear excursion limited by the suspension at 10% THD per the IEC standard. And if you increase that THD tolerance level to 20%, like you might would for a subwoofer, then that linear excursion goes to 7.6 millimeters one way. And again, that's limited by KMS. And once you put a crossover on the speaker, then what you're left with is the distortion limitations of the motor strength. And in this case, the motor strength symmetry is limited to about 8.7, and actually it's even higher than 8.7 millimeters one way. So it's got some stroke as long as you are using a crossover. And that's the thing about midwoofers. I've been doing clipple testing for a long time, and you know, I always post the data and I always say, this is a limiting factor per the data. And it's great to know that. But the practical side of things is nobody's gonna be running a six and a half inch woofer wide open. And if you are, you're begging for issues, I promise you. No matter how great you think your design is, you're compromising something somewhere. So I would typically advise to use a proper high pass filter. And in doing so, the suspension issues that you have that cause the distortion thresholds to be lowered or the excursion to be lowered, those kind of go away. And then you're left with the motor force or the inductance. And in this particular case, the motor force is gonna be the one that's probably gonna limit you. But having said that, the Clipple still wasn't able to fully resolve the motor force influence there, which means that according to the data, it's greater than 8.8 .8 or 8.7 millimeters one way before the motor force starts to become the limiting factor. In other words, you've got a lot of linear throw as long as you use a proper high pass filter. And I should also note that these numbers are based on FS and FS for this particular speaker is at 26 Hertz. Same thing, don't run the speaker down to 26 Hertz. It just doesn't make sense to run a six and a half inch midwoofer down to 26 Hertz, unless, unless maybe you're doing near field listening only and you're wanting to tune the box really, really low for relatively low levels. But if you're listening to these speakers in a, like a bookshelf from four meters away and you're trying to hit very high reference numbers, it just doesn't make sense that you would use a six and a half inch woofer to begin with. So that's kind of why I want to say that when you're looking at this data, keep these things in mind, keep the use case in mind. And when you see a limiting value, especially when it's suspension related, understand that when you use a high pass filter, that that suspension uh, driven limit is going to be mitigated. And you're going to be left with the other components most likely that are gonna be your limiting factor then. So now switching over to the frequency response, we can see that this speaker averages about 85 to 86 dB. So what it has in linear stroke, it gives up in sensitivity, not really a surprise there. You can also see that the resonance mode for this particular aluminum cone version is pushed out to at about five kilohertz or so. And the mode breakup is kind of strong. So what you would wanna use there is a good notch filter, and now we have probably the one that you've been waiting for, the eight inch version. This is also aluminum cone version. It is the PTT 8.0X. And this one retails for about $630 each. That's a lot of money. But if you are wanting probably one of the best of the best eight inch drivers out there, I would say it's the best eight inch driver that I've measured personally so far, then you're gonna to have to pay up for it. Also, while you're looking at, look at the holes to release the pressure from underneath the dust cap. So that's nice. And there's a lot of them too in here, which I find pretty interesting. 
Uh, the linear stroke on this particular driver is, let me look here. I've got six millimeters one way at 10% THD. And if you use the subwoofer limitations, then you've got 7.8 millimeters at 20% THD. And that also is suspension KMS limited. The BL of this woofer is very broad and flat. So if you're using a proper high pass filter, which I think you probably would, these aren't really subwoofers, then that limitation goes down and you're looking at closer to at least nine millimeters of one way linear excursion. I say at least because again, the clipple wasn't able to resolve the full motor force linear excursion factor of this particular driver because I didn't push it any further than I needed to. Once I saw that the limitation was a suspension, I thought I'm good there. I don't want to potentially risk damaging the speaker and I stopped. Now the FS on this driver is 20 Hertz. 20 Hertz FS was grabbed using the Clipple LSI module. So that's as the speaker is moving, I'm looking at hot cold parameters and that's the parameters that I use to design the box around. The QTS is 0.30. So you car audio people are probably thinking, you can't use that. It's got a QTS that's way too low to use in my doors. Well, okay, let me, let me explain something about QTS and car audio. And I used to think this too. We used to think the perfect QTS for you know, infinite baffle in a car, in a car door is 0.7, right? That's kind of the, the magical ratio, but F, S is the point at which QTS is taken. If you were using this as a subwoofer in an enclosure, then QTS matters because you're going to be using this driver all the way down to FS and even below if you were using it as a subwoofer, because that's how subwoofers are often used. Because you're going to be using this most likely as a mid base, then you're going to high pass it. Now you may try to cross it low. I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend crossing drive units indoors very low. I think that is kind of old hat where we want to cross a drive unit at 40 hertz because we want to get the upfront base. But really what happens is you've always got a near side knoll. That near side knoll draws attention to itself at around 70 or 80 hertz. So no matter how low you cross that left mid base, unless your car is really special, and there's a few, but there are very few and far between. Unless your car is one of those cases, you're going to have a suck out and that woofer is going to call attention to itself because it's trying to do more than it can. You're going to hear a null. You're going to hear the sound be drawn straight to that woofer. And that's why I generally explain to people that it's best to cross the mid base above that null and then let your subwoofer fill it in. But because I know it's an eight inch and I know people think I'm crazy when I say don't cross them below like 80 or 70 hertz, you're probably going to try to cross it at 40 hertz. Well, that's still above FS. By almost, yeah, it's, it's an octave above S, FS. So that transient QT, perfect number of 0.7 that you wanted, now you are no longer going to have that because as soon as you slap an electronic filter on any speaker, you change the signal that's being provided to that speaker. So you're not even going to be playing down to FS hardly at all. I mean, if you're using like a 24 dB per octave slope at 40 hertz, then you're Theoretically, you're down about 24 dB. It's actually a little bit different than that, depending on what kind of filter you're using. But let's just say you're 24 down, 24 dB down at 20 hertz. Well, the QTS doesn't really matter at that point. So that's why I say don't get hung up on QTS. Consider where you're going to place the crossover. And then if you place the crossover at 80 hertz, well, 80 down to 40, down to 20. So that's two octaves down, right? So if you go 24 dB per octave slopes and, it's, and you say it just starts flat at 80 hertz, then that's 24 plus 24, so that's 48 dB down. QTS at FS does not matter when you're using an electronic filter, especially one that's steep and or far away from FS. So keep this in mind, again, when you're looking at this kind of information. Please note that when I talk about QTS being low, that's what I'm talking about right now. Now, if QTS is really, really high, the point where it exhibits resonant type behavior, then that's a different matter altogether. But I'm specifically talking about when QTS is going to be considerably lower than that 0.7 number that we typically target. Now let's look at the frequency response. And we can see here, which surprised me actually, the sensitivity is around 89 dB on average. We can see also that the beaming starts at around one kilohertz or so. So if you wanted to use this as a two-way speaker, 
crossed over at like 60 or 80 hertz or something like that in a bookshelf with maybe a large 8-inch waveguide, I think this speaker would be a really good one for it. I mean, 89 dB sensitivity for the excursion that it has, to me, is really surprising here. Uh, the breakup modes, though, are something that's going to be a problem. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, five kilohertz. And actually, you've got a smaller one at around four kilohertz. Those are going to be problematic. You can't really fix those with a notch filter because as you go off axis, those breakups start to run into each other. Basically, what I mean is they're not behaving linearly. So where you've got a, a spike at one particular frequency on axis, that level is going to be down, yes, but it may also be shifting the frequency or depending on the next angle that you go to, that level may be back up again. So the breakup mode, the resonance of the speaker, of this particular drive unit, isn't linear as you go off axis. But at 5 kilohertz, even if it's 15 dB above your norm, I think you're going to be okay if you cross this over at like 1 kilohertz or 1.2 with a LR2 slope passively. And then I would say that LR4 would probably be best. And again, these are all just swags, okay? I don't, I'm not trying to say that these are the numbers that you're going to have to use, but they're just rough numbers looking at this to give you an idea of the bandwidth that the speaker will allow you to play it within. And in this case, again, I think that this is a really good mid-bass option for car audio or for a three-way design, or it's a good two-way option if you want to use a large waveguide. I think that would be pretty cool. Just understand your vertical directivity is going to suffer unless you use... DSP type filters for this. Otherwise, you're going to have huge passive components to make a steep crossover slope for the speaker. And uh, that would be kind of interesting. <clears throat> My voice is going out. COVID, I tell you what. All right, so harmonic distortion at 96 dB. Yeah, this thing is 50 dB all the way down to about 90 hertz, 100 hertz. And then it's 1% THD until about 60 hertz. So that, that's really, really good. Ultimately, all of these speakers are really good. None of them are cheap, but I think that they are class leading in their designs. Now, in my opinion, the eight inch one is the one that surprises me the most. And that's the one that I would personally be willing to pay up more for, because I feel like the advantage of the higher sensitivity and the long linear stroke and that breakup mode being pushed out well beyond where you're gonna cross it over anyway, are all really neat design options and characteristics that, you know, some other eight inches may have one thing or the other better, but I don't know of another eight inch that does all of those things as well as this particular one. And personally speaking, I'm actually thinking about using the eight inch version in my car, but it's going to be maybe a little bit of a different design. So, and I don't want to say anything right now because if I don't use it, then people are going to ask me about it. So I'd rather say that maybe for an update later, if I, if I do wind up using them the way I want to use them, then I will definitely follow up with a video on that at some point down the line. Now, these other two six and a half inch versions, I think are really cool within their own right as well. And I would personally be really curious to see what some of the designs that you all are able to come, with, come up with out there. And if you don't mind, as you come across this video or maybe as you do create designs with any of these woofers, please let me know. And if it's something really cool, man, I would love to test it and showcase it because in my opinion, these purified drivers, really do something that a lot of other drive units that I've heard in the past cannot do. And speaking just subjectively only, the purified designs that I've heard of bookshelf type speakers, they're superb and they have just really such great mid-range detail due to the very, very low intermodulated distortion, which I have data for that on my website. It's really remarkable. And that's the reason why I would personally choose to run them over something like a budget driver. And in the particular case of the eight inch, I think that this one's probably leading the pack by a good bit because it does so many things so well. And that's kind of my opinion of the data. You are certainly welcome to draw your own conclusions. That's why I post all this. My talking of the, of the performance is just a general guide for people to kind of get an understanding of what the specs are telling you, what my data is telling you, and maybe do a little bit of a show and tell. And so you can see the drivers just checking them out. So. With that said, I am out. Again, all the data will be on my site. If you're interested in helping this channel out, I do have a Patreon. That would be cool if you wanted to join it. But otherwise, yeah, share with your friends, like, link, subscribe, all that cool stuff. And I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.